today we will be talking about autonomic nervous system and the, the topics that we'll be covering today is somatic versus autonomic motor systems, the pre and the post ganglionic neurons, the role of sympathetic nervous system and the role of parasympathetic division. Similarly, we'll be talking about the various interactions of ANS, the receptors, neurotransmitters, and the neurotransmission in both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so when it comes to autonomic nervous system, Autonomous means is the word that has come from autonomy or involuntary, something that can carry on its activity on its own without external influence. Right? So, can you re can you reduce the intestinal motility on your own? Like, if you personally try and reduce your internal intestinal motility, then you will not be able to do so, right? Because it is involuntary and the person has got little or no control. So, such kind such kind of things are controlled by autonomic nervous system where the word autonomy means has come from autonomous and hence it's linked with autonomic nervous system it acts on the smooth muscles and the glands it controls and regulates the heart the respiratory system gi gi tract bladder eyes and glands okay while somatic nervous system is, de is de dealt with voluntary control of the, of, the, of the person right a person has voluntary control on so few things like moving the, the notebook that is in front of you you can move it away from you this is something controlled by the somatic nervous system okay have a look at this picture it tries to uh, let me hold, hide this thing okay it shows the uh, shows the comparison of autonomic and somatic motor systems, right? You can see that this is the somatic nervous system out here, and this part is the autonomic nervous system. And autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So, what are the different things that you see? You can see that. The axons are heavily myelinated in case of somatic nervous system, right? Whereas in case of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, they are lightly myelinated when it comes to the preganglionic axons, and in case of postganglionic axons, they are unmyelinated. And again, what you can see is the difference of the neurotransmitter at the effector site. That is, acetylcholine is here in case of somatic nervous system, whereas in case of sympathetic, acetylcholine is present in this synapse earlier and later on at the effector sites there is no epinephrine and epinephrine is also there in case of adrenal medulla in adrenal medulla it is both the epinephrine and no epinephrine while in case of parasympathetic it is acetylcholine again again when it comes to the effector organs like it is skeletal muscle which is supplied by the somatic nervous system and the effect is a stimulatory whereas the autonomic nervous system it supplies the stomach and heart and the different glands right smooth muscle glands and the cardiac muscle and the effect can either be stimulatory or inhibitory depending upon the neurotransmitter and the receptor receptors and effector organs so from the picture that we saw earlier what we can see is that we find this comparison over here the organ supply uh, just hold on. It seems I need to mute someone else. Right? I can feel a little bit big sound. Uh, I can't see as to who is on mute, so let it be. Okay, let me move, move forward. Uh, we just saw in the, in the picture earlier that the organ supplied in somatic nervous system is the skeletal muscles, whereas autonomic nervous system it supplies all other organs, right? The distal most synapse is within the CNS in case of somatic nervous system, whereas in case of autonomic nervous system, it is outside the CNS, that is in the ganglia. We'll be seeing this. You've seen this. You've seen this in anatomy as well, I, be, I believe, right? 
the nerve fibers are myelinated in case of somatic nervous system, whereas in case of autonomic nervous system, the pre-ganglionic ones are myelinated and the post-ganglionic ones are non-myelinated. The peripheral plexus formation is absent in case of somatic nervous system and present in case of autonomic nervous system. The efferent transmitter is acetylcholine in case of somatic nervous system and in case of autonomic nervous system, it is both acetylcholine and noradrenaline. And the effect of nerve section on the organ supply is paralysis and atrophy in somatic nervous system and the activity is maintained or no atrophy is seen in case of autonomic nervous system. Since the activity is maintained, we call it autonomic, right? Okay. ANS possesses inherent physiological activity and the nervous acti activity only augment or reduce the initial functional level. Interference with the ANS does not completely abolish the vegetative functions. In contrast, the skeletal muscles develop paralysis and atrophy due to loss of innovation. Now moving on to neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, they are the brain chemicals, right? That link the action potential of one neuron with the synaptic potential of the another. Uh, ANS, we have already subdivided into parasympathetic, it's subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic neurotransmitters are called adrenergic neurotransmitters, which constitutes epinephrine and no epinephrine, whereas parasympathetic neurotransmitter nervous system has got cholinergic neurotransmitters which is a style calling. Okay, the same picture has been repeated, which you just saw earlier, so we don't need to discuss about it. But then what we are going to do is we are going to discuss about the, the summary of sympathetic neurons and synapses. Okay, so what we can see is that the preganglionic neurons, they are sought in case of sympathetic nervous system. And here is the peripheral plexus, right? This is very near to the CNS, the spinal cord, and the brain, right? Therefore, the preganglionic neurons are very short, and the postganglionic neurons are relatively long. The synapse with the postganglionic neurons is near the spinal cord, as you can see, right? And it releases acetylcholine to activate the nicotinic receptors on the postganglionic neurons. So, even the even the sympathetic nervous system, it secretes acetylcholine at this level, at the level of preganglionic neurons. And then the postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine at the end. The postganglionic neurons, they are longer in length and they have the synapse on the target organ, right? And they release norepinephrine to activate the adrenergic receptors on the target organs. Okay, now coming on to parasympathetic neurons and synapses. What we can see is that. In case of sympathetic nervous system, there was uh, the synapse was relatively near, right? The synapse in case of sympathetic is relatively near to the spinal cord, but in case of parasympathetic nervous system, it is near to this end organ. In all the cases, you can see that the synapse is either in the end organ is very near to it. So the preganglionic neurons they are long, right? So the synapse with post neurons are at or near the organ. They release acetylcholine to activate the nicotinic receptors on the post neurons. While post neurons, they are relatively short. The synapse on the target organ itself and release acetylcholine to activate the muscarinic receptors at the target organ. What we can see is that even though the, uh, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, the receptor out here is nicotinic in the case of preganglionic neurons and muscarinic in case of postganglionic neurons. Okay, now comes the role of sympathetic division. The role of sympathetic division is there in case of fight or flight. Uh, fight or flight has come from people being able to withstand stress or facing stressful conditions, right? So if you are to move through a jungle at night, and uh, if you listen to some, some sound, probably made by some wild animals, then you enter in the stage of fight or flight. Fight, if it is a small animal, you maybe will try to take a branch from some of the trees and then try, try to fight the animal, right? And if, it's a, it's a, if it is a big animal, then you will probably try to run away from it. So it's a fight or flight activity. Uh, there are different activities involved, right? We call them E activities in case of sympathetic division. First one is exercise, exercise 
like whenever a person is exercising then the sympathetic rhythm kicks in similarly the second one is excitement third one emergency the fourth one is embarrassment it promotes the adjustments during exercise that the blood flow to the organs is reduced and flow to the muscles and the heart is increased its activity is illustrated by a person who is threatened the heart rate increases and the breathing is rapid and deep the skin is cold and sweaty the pupils are dilated okay now moving on to parasympathetic division it is basically concerned with keeping the body energy low body energy used low right it involves in d activities like digestion defecation and diuresis its activity is illustrated by a person who relaxes after meal so when you relax just imagine yourself taking a class after your meal right this most of you may have already taken your meal at this particular time so what happens is that the blood pressure heart rate and the respiratory rates are low the gi tract activity is high the skin is warm and the pupils are constricted okay now let us see the comparison of both the sympathetic stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation in different organs okay in case of eye iris the in case of sympathetic stimulation the pupil is dilated right we are talking about again fight and flight response so you don't want a wild animal to be chasing you and the pupil to be constricted because you don't want to fall into a pit nearby pit right and when you are resting on the other other side during parasympathetic stimulation there is no need to have pupil dilated right so if you are in a resting phase the pupil gets constricted similarly salivary glands the salivary uh, the saliva production is reduced during the sympathetic stimulation while parasympathetic stimulation because it is linked with digestion the saliva production is increased oral and nasal mucosa the mucus production is reduced in case of sympathetic stimulation whereas mucus production is increased in case of parasympathetic stimulation the heart heart lungs you see that the heart rate and the force is increased in case of sympathetic and also the bronchial muscle is relaxed the heart rate and force is decreased and the bronchial muscle is contracted while parasympathetic stimulation is there in case of stomach small intestine and large intestine you see that the activity is reduced right peristalsis is, is reduced the motility is reduced whereas in parasympathetic stimulation the gastric juice is secreted motility is increased digestion is increased and secretions and motility all are increased okay in case of liver in sympathetic stimulation there is increased conversion of glycogen to glucose but we don't see any activity as such during parasympathetic stimulation in kidneys we see that there is decreased urine secretion and increased urine secretion again when one is in resting phase uh, kidney there is decreased urine secretion okay sorry adrenal medulla no epinephrine and epinephrine both are secreted here there is no such action and the urinary bladder wall is relaxed sphincter is closed here the wall is contracted and the sphincter is relaxed to favor excretion of urine or micturition the interactions of the autonomic divisions we we just now we saw that most of the organs they are affected by both the sympathetic stimulation as well as parasympathetic division right but however there are certain organs which have which receive stimulation from one of the organ systems sorry one stimulation itself only like sympathetic division stimulates liver and sympathetic division uh, division stimulates the adrenal medulla right so here we'll be talking about interaction of the autonomic divisions when both of the organ systems uh, so both of the divisions are working on that very organ system there is normally dynamic antagonism that precisely controls the visceral activity the symp uh, the sympathetic fibers they increase the heart rate respiratory rate and inhibit digestion and elimination whereas parasympathetic fibers they decrease the heart and respiratory rates and allow for digestion and discarding of the wastes an animal is known to surprise uh, survive complete elimination of sympathetic but not of parasympathetic nervous system okay so we again saw that dual innervation is there in most of the cases and we saw that the most in, in most of the times there is antagonistic effect right like the example heart again if there is sympathetic stimulation when one is running there is increased heart rate and increased force of contraction but during the rest and digest phase 
there is decreased heart rate and decreased force of contraction. However, it is not mandatory that, is, that there is antagonistic effect at all times. Sometimes agonistic effect also seen, that is in case of genitals, right? Uh, in case of parasympathetic stimulation, there is vasodilatation and erection, whereas simple, simple, parasympathetic stimulation causes ejaculation in males and reflex peristalsis in females. Okay, now without dual innovation, what happens is that uh, some effective some effective organs they receive only the sympathetic stimulation, like the goosebumps that we experience during fear, right? When one experiences fear, like you when you, you watch a horror movie or you have some kind of fear, then you get goosebumps, right? That goosebump is there due to stimulus due to sympathetic stimulation. There is no stimulation from the parasympathetic nervous system here, but then when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, then goosebumps appear. And this is due to erective pili muscles, the sweat glands, and the blood vessels. They are all supplied by sympathetic stimulation, sympathetic division only. The vasomotor chain tone that is responsible for vasoconstriction is there. And that is also due to sympathetic stimulation only. If there is increase in firing due to sympathetic stimulation, then there is vasoconstriction. And when there is decrease in firing, there is vasodilatation. This is basically to save the blood to heart and to muscles so that the person is equipped for fight or flight. Okay, sympathetic stimulation increases the blood flow to skeleton and cardiac muscles, and the blood is reduced to the skin. Okay, now coming on to receptors. In sympathetic nervous system, the receptors are called adrenal receptors. The adrenal receptors are again classified into alpha and beta adrenal receptors. Alpha adrenal receptors can again be subdivided into alpha 1 and alpha 2 adrenal receptor, whereas beta are basically divided into beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 adrenal receptors. Likewise, parasympathetic subdivision has got choline receptors. Choline receptors can either be muscarinic or of nicotinic type. We saw that nicotinic type is present in synapses and in case of neuromuscular junction, and muscarinic receptors are present in the end organ. Okay, have a look at this chart. Here you see that there are different kinds of receptors. We just talked about alpha receptors, the beta receptors, right? The neuro nicotinic receptors and the muscarinic receptors. They are all short form for different kinds of re receptors. Okay, what you can see is that the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine in all of these, right? And in below here, they are norepinephrine and epinephrine. And in case of beta 2, it's the epinephrine. Uh, the type of ion channels or the type of uh, how does the signaling go in this different uh, nicotinic receptors and the muscarinic receptors is that in case of nicotinic receptors there are ion channels right in case of muscarinic receptors it is basically the muscarinic and alpha adrenal receptors it is GPCRs GPCR stands for G protein coupled receptors again. GPCR are of inhibitory type in M2 and alpha 2. And in case of beta 1 and beta 2, it is the stimulatory type. And the, in case of M1, M3, and, and alpha 1, it is the GP protein, which depends upon, which works through IP3 and DAG pathway. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. Now let us move to another one. Let us look. Let us have a look at the various adrenal receptors, their typical locations, and the result of ligand binding. Alpha one receptor. It is present in the postsynaptic effector cells, especially the smooth muscle cells, and it works through the formation of IP3 and DAG and increase intracellular calcium. Alpha two. It works through presynaptic adrenergic nerve terminals and platelets, lipocytes smooth muscle cells it um, it is sorry it works through the inhibition of adrenaline cyclase and it decreases it is known to decrease the CAP levels or the 
cyclic AMP levels. Beta 1, it is located in postsynaptic effector cells, especially the heart, lipocytes, brain, right, and the presynaptic cholinergic and adrenergic terminals. Uh, the stimulation of adrenaline cyclase is seen in, in case of all the beta receptors, whereby cyclic AMP levels is increased. The beta 2 are present in postsynaptic effector cells, especially in smooth muscles and cardiac muscles, and beta 3 are present typically in lipocytes, other fat cells. Neurotransmitter binding to receptors can be can occur via receptors that are coupled to ion channels. We just said early, earlier that the nicotinic receptors are coupled with ion channels. And the second type of receptor may be coupled with adenylyl cyclase. You said earlier that adenylyl cyclase was increased in most in most of the cases, right? And the receptor coupled to IP3 and DAG pathway. Okay, now have, let us have a look at the receptor coupled through ion channels. This is something that you've already studied earlier, right? When you were talking, when we were, uh, when you learned the basic pharmacology, this must have been discussed by the teacher who dealt with the receptors, uh, receptor coupled ion channels. So what happens over here is that the receptors that are present in postsynaptic receptors of nerve and muscle, they are directly linked with the membrane ion channels and the binding of the receptor occurs rapidly and directly affects the ion permeability. And here you can see that the neurotransmitter has increased the permeability to the chloride ions, right? And this changes the membrane potential or ionic concentration within the cell, whereby a sequence of events will happen. The second type is receptor coupled to second messenger systems. We call them second messenger systems because they intervene between the original message, that is the neurotransmitter or the hormone, and the ultimate effect of the, on the cells, and they lead to the cascade of events, and usually there is intervention of G protein. And this can move forward through adenylyl cyclase system or calcium phosphatidyl inositol system or the IP3 pathway. Uh, so receptors coupled to ion channels, they are seen in case of nicotinic receptors. Receptors coupled with adenylyl cyclase, it was seen with muscarinic receptor type 2, alpha 2, and all the beta receptors. And receptors coupled to, uh, coupled to uh, diacylglycerol and inositol type phosphate is seen with alpha 1, M1, and M3 receptors. OK, now moving on to cholinergic receptors. There are two types of receptors that bind acetylcholine. They are nicotinic and muscarinic, and they are named after the drugs that bind to them and mimic the acetylcholine effect. Nicotinic receptors, the, the name has come from nicotine. You know that in the smoke, there is nicotine, right, in cigarette, so it has come from the same one. Muscarinic receptors has come from the name muscarin, and muscarin is something uh, that's, uh, the word has come from mushroom, Amanita muscaria. So, Mushrooms, they are known to occupy this receptor and nic nicotine that is obtained in the cigarette is known to act on these different receptors. That's why they are named nicotinic and muscarinic accordingly. The nicotinic receptors are found in motor end plates. Right? All the ganglionic neurons of both the sympathetic and parasympathetic regions, as we saw earlier, they are also are seen in, found in hormone producing cells of the adrenal medulla. The effect of acetylcholine binding to nicotinic receptors is always stimulatory. Whereas muscarinic muscari receptors, they occur on all effector cells stimulated by postganglionic cholinergic fibers. The effect of acetylcholine binding can be either inhibitory or excitatory. It depends upon the receptor type of the target organ. Okay, so earlier we saw the receptor type, location, and the post receptor mechanism of uh, adrenergic receptors. Now let us have a look at the the same thing for muscarinic receptors. We just said earlier that M stands for muscarin, right? So the muscarinic receptors are further subdivided into M1, M2, and M3. And over here, this is nicotinic muscle and nicotinic neurons. So NM and NN stands for nicotinic receptors. Have a look at the location and post receptor mechanism. Sir, most carinic receptor go if per fear one, is it not? Most carinic receptor, what is it? 
एस्टाइलिनर्जिक रिसेप्टर लाइन हमें मस्कानिक रिसेप्टर भाई है मस्कानिक रिसेप्टर भाई पोस्ट रिसेप्ट पोस्ट गैंग्लोनिक न्यूरोन्स एक्ट करने ठाव में मस्कानिक रिसेप्टर हो प्री गैंग्लोनिक होने ठाव में निकोटेनिक होता मस्कानिक रिसेप्ट आदोस्ट विच आर प्रेजेंट इन द पोस्ट गैंग्लोनिक एरिया अफ पारिपेथेटिक स्टिमुलेसन पारिपेथेटिक डिविजन ओके Okay, it seems those of you who joined lately, I forgot to unmute you, right? It's okay. Just make sure there is no unnecessary noise out there. Ah, okay, so let's move move forward. Ah, uh, M one is present in the nerves, right? M two is present in the heart, nerves, and the smooth muscles. M three is similarly located in the glands, the smooth muscles, and the endothelium. Here, they act through IP three DAG in M one and M three. And there is inhibition of CAMP production in M2. Neuromuscular NM receptors they are present in neuromuscular junction, right? So they act through ion channel. We said that earlier. And NM or the nicotinic neuronic neurons receptor they are present in post ganglionic cell body and the dendrites. Okay, they also work through ion channels. Okay, this is the summary of the neurohumeral process transmission process. Uh, There is impulse conduction, right? The impulse comes to the preganglionic neuron, then it releases the neurotransmitter. So the the second step is release of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter then acts as a post post junctional membrane. This is the third step. Then after the neurotransmitter has act on the post junctional activity, post junctional membrane, there is a certain post junctional activity that elicits, elicits, right? So that's the fourth step, and the last step is the termination of the Neurotransmitter action. Okay, now this is in relation with sympathetic nervous system, right? What you can see out here in this picture, I'm not sure whether it's totally clear to you guys, right? This is taken from Lippincott Pharmacology, so you guys can have a go go back to the book and have a look at it again, in case the picture is not that clear. Okay, let me explain what is going on over here. Have a look at this picture for a while. This shows the various steps from synthesis to uptake of the neurotransmitter in the storage vesicles. The third step, it marks the release of the neurotransmitter. The fourth one, the binding of the neurotransmitter to the receptors. The fifth one is the removal of the neurotransmitter from the synaptic cleft, and the sixth one is metabolism of the neurotransmitter again. Okay, what you can see out here is that the the first thing that is used in Preparing the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is tyrosine, right? Tyrosine converts into dopa, dopa converts into dopamine. Then dopamine gets inside the vesicle, and dopamine is again converted into norepinephrine, and norepinephrine is converted into epinephrine in adrenal medulla. In all other sites, it is the norepinephrine that is that is working, right, as a neurotransmitter. In case of adrenal medulla, the norepinephrine is again converted into epinephrine. We'll be seeing that also slow, shortly. So let us have a look. Uh, no epinephrine itself, if it is made, when when made, it can get converted by MAO or monoamine oxidase. This enzyme converts no epinephrine into inactive metabolite, and similarly, the MAO can act on dopamine and dopa as well. Both of them, it converts all of these into inactive metabolites, and these inactive metabolites are excreted via urine. The dopamine that is formed enters into the vesicles, right? And they are stored in vesicles until there is a stimulation. If there is a stimulation, the calcium enters, and the entry of the calcium will cause the fusion of these vesicles out here, and this will cause the release of the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. And the release of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft will cause them to act on the post-junctional membrane, right? So there will be binding of the receptors, binding of the neurotransmitter with different receptors that is present in the post-junctional space. And some of the neurotransmitters that are remained over here, they are reuptaken or they are removed by different mechanisms. And again, there is metabolism of different neurotransmitters by MAO and COMT. MAO stands for monoamine oxidase. And COMT stands for catechol or methyltransferase. 
these are the two different enzymes that are responsible for the breakdown of sympathetic neurotransmitters. And monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they are a class of drugs that are often used as antidepressants. They are used in psychiatry. Right? And these are the ones that stop the inactivation of the neurotransmitter into inactive metabolites. Again, there's another drug called rezepine. Rezepine is not used much these days. Earlier, it was it used to be used in case of hypertension. It was being used as a hypertensive, but then it has a problem of causing suicidal tendency, so it is not used much. What is basically it? It, it doesn't let the accumulation of the neurotransmitter within the vesicles. So less of the vesicles will be having the neurotransmitters because of preserpine. The third group out here, the drugs you can see, tricyclic antidepressants, TCA stands for tricyclic antidepressants and cocaine, which is a drug of abuse. What they do is, they hamper the reuptake of the neurotransmitter inside the presynaptic neurons. Again, there are some other norepinephrine releasing agents. These are indirectly acting drugs and mixed acting drugs. Amphetamine, the Superman drug, right? Ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, pentaramine, tyramine. These all are the different drugs which act indirectly. So, like the, the, the drug like amphetamine, it doesn't have direct action on its own. So what it does is it releases the neurotransmitter out here and the action of amphetamine is Loss is due to norepinephrine that is released over here. But drugs like ephedrine, they have both the actions. They release norepinephrine and they also have direct action. So we call drugs like ephedrine mixed acting drug, whereas amphetamine is an indirectly acting drug. We'll be talking about all these drugs in detail in individual classes. Today is just an introduction. So let us move to another step. Okay, have a look, look at this picture over here. This is a strip of neurotransmitter synthesis, right? Here we saw you the synthesis of noradrenaline and adrenaline, and also the synthesis of acetylcholine has been shown over here. In case of the noradrenaline and adrenaline synthesis, you see that the first thing is tyrosine, right? The first element in the first compound is tyrosine. Tyrosine gets converted into dopa, dopamine, and Again, it gets converted into noradrenaline and adrenaline. So the conversion of tyrosine to dopa by tyrosine hydroxylase, this is the rate limiting step and this is the slowest step. That is why we call it a rate limiting step. And once dopa is made, the conversion of dopa into noradrenaline takes place very fast. That's why the most important step or the slowest step is the conversion of tyrosine to dopa by the action of tyrosine hydroxylase. In case of cholinergic system, acetylcholine, acetylcholine A and choline, they make they bond together to form acetylcholine, and there is the presence of choline esterase, sorry, choline acyl transferase in this, in this reaction as a Okay, this is this, the explanation of the same thing that we just talked about. So let us escape this slide. Okay, we saw this same picture in a little bit different way earlier, right? The same thing, there was conversion of tyrosine into noradrenaline and the action over here. But then here we have introduced one or two different drugs over here, alpha methyl tyrosine, which is, this is a drug that is used in case of pheochromocytoma, and pheochromocytoma is a tumor of adrenal medulla where there is lots of noradrenaline base being secreted. Adrenal, adrenaline and noradrenaline are secreted, and there is excessive hypertension. This is an emergency condition, and there needs to be a surgery should be done very soon. But when a person is being prepared for surgery, they are often given the drug orally, alpha methyl tyrosine orally. Which, step, which stops the conversion of tyrosine into noradrenaline. 
So this is a drug that is used in that case. The another drug, methyl dopa is here, is shown over here. Methyl dopa, again, it works in the step of conversion of dopa to noradrenaline. It enters in that step and it converts methyl dopa into methyl noradrenaline. This is a false neurotransmitter and it does not let this steps happen, right? Other things we'll be discussing later on. Okay, now this is the thing. This is a picture for parasympathetic neurotransmitter, right? Here you can see that choline has moved and to form acetylcholine. Choline and acetylcholine A, they, con they condense together to form acetylcholine, right? And the acetylcholine is stored in the synaptic vesicles. There is release of acetylcholine in the in the synaptic plate, the acetylcholine then has act on the post junctional membrane. There is degradation of acetylcholine by choline esterase, and there is recycling of choline so, so that the same choline goes over here to form new acetylcholine molecule. Acetylcholine is synthesized with the nerve terminal, within the nerve terminal from choline, right? Uh, the rate limiting step over here is acetyl in is the choline transport. Over there, the rate limiting step was the conversion of tyrosine to dopa. Here, it is the choline transport that is the rate limiting step. Others happen quite fast. The choline esterase is the enzyme that is responsible for the breakdown of the acetylcholine molecule in the terminals. So choline esterase is known to break down the acetylcholine pretty fast within few within few milliseconds. So let us have a look at how the drugs are known to influence the ANS. Uh, the drugs that mimic or block the effect of two primary neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and norepinephrine, they are named differently out here. Right? We have used the term agonist and antagonist earlier. Agonist are the, are the drugs that act on the receptor and produce action like the produce positive actions, right? So they were called agonist. Over here, in case of ANS, we don't use the term agonist so much. We rather use the term mimetic, right? Because the drugs that mimic the neurotransmitter, they are referred to as receptor agonist or mimetics. They are known to activate the receptors. So the drugs that we, we used to call antagonist here will be using lytics like terms. Here, this slide gives you a much better picture. Have a look. Okay, in case of parasympathetic nervous system, which we call, which is basically the rest and digest type, right? Yeah, the, if the drug mimics acetylcholine, then we call it cholinergic or muscarinic agonist or parasympathomimetic. Mimetic has come from the word mimic because it mimics acetylcholine. The second one, if the, if the drug is known to block the effect of acetylcholine, then it is either called anticholinergic or muscarinic antagonist, as we know, right? Or the another term is parasympatholytic. Lytic means to break down, right? So blocking the action is called lytic and mimicking the action is called mimetic. Similarly, in case of parasympathetic nervous system, if a drug mimics norepinephrine, then it's called adrenergic, adrenergic agonist or sympathomimetic. And if the drug blocks the norepinephrine, we call it anti-adrenergic, adrenergic antagonist or sympatholytic. Okay, here are a few terms like adrenaline rush and adrenaline junkie. Right? And adrenaline rush, it is a fight or flight response of the adrenal gland in which it releases adrenaline. I don't know how many of you have gone for either bungee jumping. We don't bungee if any one of you have tried it. Then that gives you adrenaline rush, isn't it? And the person who goes for this kind of adrenaline rush on a regular basis is called adrenaline junkie. That's all for today's class. Thank you, everyone.